welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Love it. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and everyone is welcome at UU. So excited to be here and hear Melly's message. So we are gathered here, and if you know this, you can sing along, but you don't have to stand. <laughs> gathered here in the mystery of the hour. Gathered here in one strong Jory, and welcome everyone to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Fayetteville. And if you can say that three times fast, you too can be a member. <laughs> <laughs> I sense this is a really above average crowd because um, you're here. Uh, you chose to be here. You're smart. Some of you, maybe you were forced to come, um, but we're glad, we're glad you're here too and hopefully I think we will all get something out of this service. Melly is speaking today on building a mystery, embracing the unknown. And like every time Melly speaks, this is something this is something I need to hear. I like having things settled. I like mystery shows, but I want to know by the end of it who did it, right? I don't like it hanging. And so learning to live with that uncertainty. I'm really looking forward to to our service. We're glad to have you. If you are a first time visitor and wouldn't mind filling out the white card on the back of the seat in front of you, just to tell us a little bit about you and we'll put you on our email list, which you can unsubscribe from if you, uh, if you so choose, but uh, you can put that in the offering basket later on. There are also yellow joys and concerns cards. If there's a joy or a sorrow or a need you want to share um, you can fill that out, and later in the service, there will be a time to bring those up, as well as dropping of stones. Uh, and those joining us online, welcome, and you also uh, will be invited to share those at the appropriate time, uh, joys and concerns. Um, I don't see any really young children, but you know about the nursery, so. Uh, oh. Avon calling. Okay, someone found the doorbell. Uh, <laughs> threw me totally off. What's next? Oh, well, if you have a need for hearing assistance, our tech, our amazing tech, David, can help you out. 
Uh, remember to silence your cell phone. Yeah. And after our service, we have coffee and juice and water and snacks, and we invite you to stick around, uh, visit, let's get to know each other. Melly has some opening words for us. Hi, I'm Melly. Forgive my voice uh, this morning. Um, sinuses are a thing, and they suck. Uh, I am going to be giving our opening words from our awesome hymnal. Uh, if you haven't perused it, I highly recommend you do so. There's some cool stuff in here. But this is one of the readings in the back, um, credited to Jacob Trapp. It's called To Worship. To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars before a leaf, a flower, or a grain of sand. To worship is to be silent, receptive, before a tree astir with the wind or the passing shadow of a cloud. To worship is to work with dedication and with skill. It is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music. To worship is to sing with the singing beauty of the earth and to listen through a storm to the still small voice within. Worship is a loneliness seeking communion. It is a thirsty land crying out for rain. Worship is kindred fire within our hearts. It moves through deeds of kindness and through acts of love. Worship is the mystery within us reaching out to the mystery beyond. It is an inarticulate silence yearning to speak. It is a window of the moment, open to the sky of the eternal. Let us enter into this time with openness. Join me uh, to light the chalice. Love is the spirit of this community, and service is its prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in truth, and to help one another. Thus, we do covenant together. Thank you. This next song is one of Melly's favorites. <laughs> This is from our teal hymnal, the, the third song, and the, the words will be on the screen. Now there are four parts, so we're going to sing it once. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to sing it once together so you know the parts, and then we're going to divide with the folks in the choir and then this row. If you're sitting on the end, and yes, that includes you, Laura, you're going to be singing part one. Part one. Part two and then part three and part four. But let's sing it all together so you know the parts and they all sing together with different note values and it sounds really good together. So let's learn it and then we'll stand up and sing it. So here's the first part. Everyone sing this part. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? You just repeat that. Right, let's do that again. One, two. second part is going to hold really long notes. Where do we come from? One more time. Where do we come from? Awesome. In the third section, we'll sing mystery. in between all the parts. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Again, where do we come from? Where are we going? Nice. We'll start with the first part. 
part, they're going to sing it a couple of times. They're going to bring in part two, part three, part four. Once you get your part, just keep singing it. Come on in and find a seat. Welcome. We're just now learning this song, and you're filling in in the third section. Nice. <laughs> All right, if you're willing and able, please stand and give it some energy. And think about the words to this. There are no easy answers. Hmm. <laughs> Excuse me? Lots. <laughs> yes. One, two, one. <laughs> one, two, here we go. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we? So um, our story this morning is not really a story. It is from this awesome book. Uh, it's called the Pablo Neruda Book of Questions. Um, there are lots of questions in this book, and we've selected some of them, which is kind of funny because it says selections from Pablo Neruda. So this is selections from selections um, from this awesome book. The illustrations are amazing. Uh, they are also very difficult to photograph. So forgive my bad cell phone photography. Also, this book is written in two languages. It is in English and also in Spanish. Um, so Jean is going to read the Spanish parts. If you don't know Spanish, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to read the English part. Or you can just listen to the Spanish parts if you don't speak Spanish and look at the pictures and see what that does to you. And when we're finished, uh, I'm going to let you know that if you have a, a desire, you go to the library and get this book and read all the questions and look at all the pictures because they're amazing. This isn't meant to answer any questions, uh, as is pretty typical of Pablo Neruda. You're probably going to walk away with more questions. All right. Here we go. Here we go. So why do rocks have so many wrinkles and so many holes? ¿Y para qué tantas arrugas y tanto agujero en la roca? Does the earth chirp like a cricket in the symphony of the skies? Who shouted for joy when the color blue was born? ¿Canta la tierra como tingrío entre la música celeste? ¿Quiénes gritaron de alegría cuando nació el color 
azul. Do unshed tears wait in little lakes or become invisible rivers that rush towards sadness? Las lágrimas que no se lloran esperan en pequeños lagos o serán ríos invisibles que corren hacia la tristeza. When I look once more at the sea, does the sea see me or not see me? Why do the waves ask me the same questions I ask them? Cuando veo de nuevo el mar, ¿el mar me ha visto o no me ha visto? ¿Por qué me preguntan las olas lo mismo que yo les pregunto? Where is the center of the sea? Why don't the waves break there? ¿Dónde está el centro del mar? ¿Por qué no van allí las olas? And could it be that the earth is briefly borrowing the sea? Won't we have to return it with its tides to the moon? ¿Y no estará prestado el mar por un corto tiempo a la tierra? ¿No tendremos que devolverlo con sus mareas a la luna? How did the abandoned bicycle find its freedom? Who sings from the watery depths of the abandoned lagoon? How do I express to the tortoise that I surpass him in slowness? <laughs> ¿Cómo logró su libertad la bicicleta abandonada? ¿Quién canta en el fondo del agua en la laguna abandonada? ¿Cómo le digo a la tortuga que yo le gano en lentitud? Do you hear the explosions of yellow in the middle of the fall? If we use up all the yellow, with what will we make bread? Hoy es en medio del otoño detonaciones amarillas. Si se termina el amarillo, ¿con qué vamos a hacer el pan? I have to show you this because it's really cool. So this page actually opens up to become this page. And what did the rubies say? Faced with the juice of the pomegranates, and do you know which is more difficult, to sprout or to reap? ¿Y qué dijeron los rubíes antes el jugo de las granadas? ¿Y sabes lo que es más difícil entre granar y desgranar? What knowledge is in the bee for it to figure out its itinerary? How many bees are in a day? ¿Qué letras conoce la abeja para saber su itinerario? ¿Cuántas abejas tiene el día? How do the oranges on an orange tree share the sun? <laughs> Who wakes up the sun when it sleeps upon its blazing bed? Don't you see that apple blossoms bloom in order to die as apples? ¿Cómo se reparten el sol en el naranjo las naranjas? ¿Quién despierta al sol cuando duerme sobre su cama abrasadora? ¿No ves que florece el manzano para morir en la manzana? And does a word not slither like a snake 
Y no, y no se arrastra una palabra a veces como una serpiente. But why wasn't Thursday convinced to go after Friday? <laughs> How old is November? And what do you call that month between December and January? Pero por qué no se convence el huevos de ir después de viernes? ¿Cuántos años tiene noviembre? ¿Y cómo se llama ese mes que está entre diciembre y enero? Why the night hat? fly away full of holes? Why in the darkest of times is everything written in invisible ink? ¿Por qué el sombrero de la noche vuela con tantos agujeros? ¿Por qué en las épocas oscuras se escribe con tinta invisible? Where can you find a bell? that rings inside your dreams. Where does the stuff of dreams go? Does it pass into the dreams of others? Donde encontrar una campana que suene adentro de tus sueños? Donde van las cosas del sueño? Se van al sueño de los otros? Might I ask my book if I'm the one who really wrote it? Puedo preguntar a mi libro si es verdad que yo lo escribí. There you go. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Melly. It is time for a tradition we have of sharing joys and concerns. For many people, it's just dropping a stone, uh, representing your own special uh, gladnesses and sadnesses that have come into your life. If there's something you want to write down and, uh, and bring up with you, this would be the time to do that. There's a place on there to indicate if you want it shared publicly or just shared uh, privately with, with the leadership. So let's do that at this time, if you would.
scores or concerns, not today, but we are glad for all of you joining us. <clears throat> there are about a dozen people who join us live every Sunday, and then a lot of others who watch this later in the week, um, so we're always glad to to have you with us either right now or whenever in the future you're, you're watching. Shares this. In light of what happened this week, this weekend, I challenge everyone to speak peace and to seek peace. Amen. And I'm sure there are many others' uh, concerns and uh, joys on our hearts that we want to drop stones for those that are unspoken. Perhaps you're not ready to share, perhaps never ready to share publicly, but they're there nonetheless. And let us drop some stones for the joys and sorrows we will encounter this week in the mystery of what faces us. Let's have a minute of silence, of reflection, uh, if prayer, if that's what you, what you engage in, and just uh, think about all of these things. Okay. It is time for our offering. This fellowship is sustained almost entirely by the, the, the voluntary gifts of its members. Uh, there are a lot of ways to give. Uh, you know, I've noticed a lot of churches don't pass the basket anymore. I think the pandemic, that and, you know, Venmo and just all the, all the other ways people can give and probably most of our members do give electronically, but we still like to pass the basket uh, and offer an opportunity to put something in to express uh, your support of this fellowship. And so if you're able to do that, we, your, your gifts are greatly appreciated. So let's do that now. And Jory, in just a minute, is going to also do us a song. Or right now. Go ahead and get it. All right, as our as our ushers pass the baskets. <clears throat> All right, I'm sure this is I'm not the only one who loves this song. So sing along if you'd like and knowing that it's Joni Mitchell, I had to totally retune the guitar.
tunes and ferris wheels the dizzy dancing way you feel as every fairy tale comes real i've looked in love that way but now it's just another yourself away I've looked at love from both sides now from give and take and still somehow it's love's illusions I recall I really don't know love at all Tears and fears and feeling proud to say I love you right out loud. Dreams and schemes and circus crowds. I've looked at life that way. But now old friends are acting strange. They shake their heads. They say I've changed. But something's lost. Things gained in living every day. I've looked at life from both sides now, from win and lose, and still somehow it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't. Thank you. Thank you. I asked Jory to, to do that song, and um, speaking of knowing and not knowing, I asked, like, you, 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 you know how to play this song? And she's like, of course I know this song. And I'm like, oh, you misunderstand. I think if there's anybody in this congregation that I know knows that song, it's you. I was just asking if she performed it before or knew how to do that. Um, I saw an interview with Joni Mitchell um, not quite too long ago, and someone asked her about this song and if she knew anything else, and she said, no. <laughs> no. Knowing, not knowing. I love trivia. Who else loves trivia? I love quiz shows. I love uh, quiz games. Did you know that Trivial Pursuit has over a hundred different versions? That's just Trivial Pursuit. That's not even counting all the other trivia games that are out there. So clearly, human beings like to know things. You use also really like to know things. We like facts and figures, um, all of the things that are measured. Science is awesome. Um, I have so many quiz games at my house. I love to sit with my partners, and we don't even play the game. We just read the cards. Yeah. So humans like to know. Jeopardy is a testament to the desire of humans to know things and also to share what they know. Um, it's over 60 years that it's been on the air, 40 of those continuously running. So we like it. But I like to also watch people's reactions when I play quiz games with them. Um, usually there's a couple of different responses when people don't know the answer. One of them is people who get upset. They get angry at the game. They get 
grumpy with other players, get mad at themselves. Um, I don't really like playing with those people very much. Um, but other people act very differently when presented with a question they do not know the answer to, and then the answer is given because we like to get the answers to. Um, the response is delight. Uh, like you, you may know those people or be one and they're like, oh wow, really? Or that's, that's really cool. Or even the kind of redundant, I didn't know that. <laughs> but the underlying feel of all of those responses is the same. There's a delight, there's a joy in finding out new things. Um, and that, that's really cool. But I noticed something playing these games. Um, when you play trivia games, often you recycle the questions. They come up over and over again. And you would think that after a few times through, everyone would know all the answers. Uh, but in my very unscientific uh, exploration of this, I have noticed that the people who are angry at not knowing the answer very rarely remember it when it comes around again. And I imagine that this is because they're so full up with being upset what they didn't know that they didn't have space to take in the answer. But we also like not to know. We like to not know things. There were 12 seasons of Unsolved Mysteries. And this is a show that at the very beginning of it, you know that this is unsolved mystery. You're not going to get to the, well, occasionally they would be like, ooh, updates, and those were interesting. But for the most part, here's the thing, and we don't know how it ends. Oh, wow, I, I can't wait for next week's episode. <laughs> These are unsolved mysteries. Surprises. Birthday surprises, Christmas presents that you don't know what you're getting, or even a coworker that brings you a soda that you didn't ask for. These are things we did not know. And there is joy in that. Some people have a very hard time with this. These are the people that have to open their Christmas presents before Christmas gets here. <laughs> Some people have a hard time with things changing, too. I'm one of those people. I'm neurodivergent. Um, I... Like, I need to know what's going on for the day, and I have to write it all down in my head. And sometimes people have asked, well, why can't you just change? I'm like, you don't understand. My brain does not work like a computer. I can't just cut and paste and move things around. It's more like writing it out in script. And if something changes, I have to rip out the whole page and throw the whole thing away and start at the top and write the whole thing again, because that's how my brain works. So you can understand that if something changes in there, and I have to rip out the page and start it all over again, this can cause a big disruption. Being able to accept that something is changing or that I don't know what's happening is very, very difficult for me in regular life. I'm working on it. One of the ways that I work on it is acknowledging that there is no plan is in itself a plan. I have to look at it that way. What's the plan? There is no plan. Okay, that's the plan. Because now it's intentional. There not being a plan is the purpose. It's the point. And I am free to explore within that. Human beings like boundaries. We like to know where we're safe. We like to know where those edges are. And sometimes not knowing means that we have no idea where those edges are, and that can be very scary. But surprises, in general, are considered good things, happy things. Children are very good at this, uh, both getting surprises and surprising you. And they're also good at another thing, which is curiosity. Curiosity is rooted in not knowing. You don't know, so you go find something. What are you going to find? I don't know. There was an experiment done with robots um, where half of the robots were given an objective and half of the robots were not given the same objective. Now, the point was for both sets of robots to complete the objective. It was like putting a ball into a cup. But this set of little robots knew what the objective was before they started, and this set didn't. And much to the surprise of the researchers and developers, the set that had no end point actually figured out how to get the ball in the cup sooner. 
There are lots of speculations for this, but one of the main and um, most, most forward ones is that not having an objective at the end meant that those robots did not cut off avenues that they perceived as unuseful. So they tried everything. And when something worked, surprise! Hey, that was a thing. I, hey, they gave me a happy I did the thing. Whereas these other robots who are so locked in to a known outcome consider something that they do not already perceive as a means to this outcome as unuseful and not worth pursuing. Curiosity makes us find things out faster. Not knowing leads to knowing more. Curiosity and wonder are good things. And so is sitting with the unknown. Many spiritual paths value meditation or any other kind of sitting in silence or communing with your deity, just sitting in prayer, sitting with God. These are moments where we take advantage of putting aside the need to know in order to simply be, to take in our own selves to reflect, to kind of put away finding out other things for the moment, to sit in comfort and peace with what we are. Meditation has myriad health benefits. Um, Renee is the person to ask about that. Uh, so knowing that we are not seeking knowledge for the moment is a calm place, relief stress, it helps us renew our energy when we leave that place. All these are good things. Experiencing things for what they are can be hard. We worry about what's next and lose track of what's happening now. So these moments where we sit with our unknowns or with our single knowns can help us even things out. So that's good things about being okay with the unknown, but what are the bad things about being not okay? I mean, surely it's not a good thing to be okay with the unknown. We have to know, right? Being uncomfortable with a lack of knowledge is in fact its own risk. My mother, who's becoming a source of wisdom more and more, go figure, um, <clears throat> said once uh, to a group of church ladies, she says, if you can't handle trusting what you don't know, now this is Christian context, um, but still incredibly valid. If you can't handle trusting what you can't know, you open yourself up to false prophets. Hmm. What does that mean? When we look at something and have to have, yes? Sure. If you can't handle trusting what you can't know, you open yourself up to false prophets. If there is a desire in us to know, to have to have to understand, to have to have an answer to everything, to know what the end point is going to be at every point in time, we cannot know those things. These are things that are unknowable. But if we insist on having an answer no matter what, I guarantee you there will be people to supply answers for you. We don't need to look very far to see people supplying answers. Many of those answers are not just silly or just wrong. They're dangerous on a very big level. One of the things that is hard for people is to not understand other people. We are humans. I am not this human or that human or that human or that human. I am this human. As such, it is absolutely impossible for me to know what that human 
is experiencing themselves. I cannot know that. The saying is, you know, walk a mile in somebody's shoes. But if you do that, you will not know what it was like for them to walk that mile. You will know what it was like for you to walk it in their shoes. That's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. As human beings, it is impossible for us to truly and completely understand any other human being's experience completely. And that can be very, very scary for people who don't understand other people. I do not understand what it is like to be straight. I don't. Not at all. Zero percent. You can explain it to me. I can see the evidence of how other people experience this in the world all around me. I do not feel it. I will not understand it. And it doesn't matter how much you explain it to me. I will never be able to understand what straight people feel when they feel what they feel. Insisting on understanding to accept that something exists creates a gulf between us because we can never understand someone else's existence. Your existence is not dependent on someone else's understanding. And someone else's existence is not dependent on your understanding it. You do not need to understand what someone else is feeling, doing, or living to accept that it is real and that it is happening. The Me Too movement was full of this at the beginning and still is. Well, I don't see that. I don't experience that. I don't know what you're talking about. Countless acts of racism are shoved under by people saying, I don't see that. I don't understand how you can take it that way. I don't feel that. Understanding is only part of opening yourself up to what other people are and what they're experiencing. Being open to not knowing is an act of compassion. Being open to recognizing that you do not understand what someone else is feeling allows you the space to have compassion for what they are experiencing and the ability to give them space to experience it. Being afraid of what we don't know can stop things in its tracks. Frozen with the myriad possibilities of what might be or what could happen. Well, what will happen if we let all those immigrants across the border? Well, what will happen if, 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 we, don't, if we don't make sure that these particular things stay in our schools? What will happen if we let children think for themselves? There's, there's too many unknowns there. We have to make sure we know what's happening. We have to make sure we know what's going on. Fear is a killer of movement. It's a killer of understanding. We often talk about how creative children are. The children don't grow out of creativity. They grow into fear. They grow in to not wanting to present something that is not up to someone else's standard or what they think something should be. Like those little robots, they cut off pathways that they don't perceive as being useful. And that turns into adults who sit with a piece of paper terrified to even put the pencil down on it.
Now, I'm not saying that ignorance, willful ignorance, is a good thing. There are things we need to know. There are things we need to find out. But being comfortable with not knowing everything is a pathway to knowing more and more deeply about the things that matter. I can spend all day looking up and researching why plants grow the way they do, what the etymology of this flower is, this bug, this whatever it is, looking at it, figuring out how the hydraulics of insects makes them move, or I could just sit there and watch the bee on the flower and be amazed that it exists in the first place. Nobody wants to be afraid. We all want to be at peace. We all want to feel safe. But my hope is that we can sit and be okay with some of the things that we cannot know. We are only human. After all. So let's recognize what not knowing can do for us and what insistence on knowing can do to us. I hope this week that you find some time to sit and know nothing, to let your mind still of all those things that you think you have to figure out before tomorrow, before next week, before next year, before you die. And exist in the wonder of being you in this moment, at this time, right now. It has never existed before. It will never exist again. And this, I know. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Millie. When some of those concepts have, have revealed themselves to me, it just was a big sigh of relief. Ah, I like this next song. <laughs> so please rise and, and sing if you're willing and able. <clears throat> roll off the tongue, but, you know. <laughs> okay, repeat with me. We extinguish this flame, but do not the lack of hope, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we care for our hearts until we are yet You always make me think, Nellie. And a couple things that popped into mind. One, a bumper sticker I saw once that said, I'm a militant agnostic. I don't know, and neither do you. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one's a quote, I don't know who said it, um, 
that uh, it is far better to have unanswered questions than unquestioned answers. Ooh. Um, well, you see here our announcements, and um, most of you know how to read. They're also in the uh, order of service. I do, I'll highlight that uh, today the Web of Life, uh, which is our nature-based spirituality group, is having their monthly meeting. Um, the summer, you know, is a time when, when the pace slows down a little bit. People are traveling. People are taking swimming lessons, <laughs> enjoying ice cream, hopefully staying, staying well hydrated. <laughs> and so our normal uh, children's and adult RE is not meeting, as they usually do at 10 o'clock. However, there's some people just had to get together. And so we do have an informal discussion group at 10 a.m., and I hear they had plenty to talk about this morning. Um, and so you're, you're welcome to come to that downstairs at 10 a.m. every Sunday. We're not slowing down as far as awesome services uh, because next Sunday uh, John Johnson will be speaking. And then two weeks from today, Mayor Lionel Jordan who's spoken here before, but he'll be with us. Um, there's some energy building for a service later in the fall to talk about voting. Um, most of us, I hope, I think, are regular voters, but uh, someone overheard a UU person say, I don't bother with voting. What's the point? So we're, we're tackling that. We're going to answer that question. And there's some things, there's a lot of mystery about some things that may or may not be on the ballot in Arkansas. Uh, and we'll be talking, of course, about the national election, but local elections as well. So uh, there is, it's scary, the mystery, isn't it, that, uh, that faces all of us. But uh, hopefully you're on our uh, email list that Fawn sends out every Wednesday, a great announcement email that I'm sure we all read thoroughly so look for that for other uh, coming events. All right. And, and as I said earlier, we invite you to stay for refreshments. And uh, Melly has some closing words, and then Jory will play us out. My closing words today are uh, from that great classic, Men in Black. Um, <laughs> And if you haven't seen Men in Black, it is a movie about aliens that exist on the planet and the secret organization, not government, that uh, works to deal with that stuff. Uh, one of the agents or potential agents has just found out that this is a thing that actually exists. And Time Lee Jones sits and says, 1,500 years ago, we knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, we knew that the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that humans were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Jory, will you sing us out? Have a great week, everybody. Good job. Good job. Thank you. And Jean, might I say, tu hablas español muy excelente. I can read it. Uh, <laughs> Same. Take these questions with you this week with coffee and conversation.